My name is John Narrell, author of Show Up, Six Strategies to Lead a More Energetic and Impactful Career. And if you want to learn how to define your best life and have the courage to live it, you should be listening to the More Than Corporate podcast with my good friend, Amber Furman. Welcome to the More Than Corporate podcast, where we discuss finding fulfillment, defining success, and living your best life. There's no roadmap to success, no one-size-fits-all answer to fulfillment. I believe it requires us all to be vulnerable and authentic about what we want to accomplish and have the courage to step out of our comfort zone to chase our dreams. Keep listening to hear stories from inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. I am so excited to bring to you today this episode with my good friend, John Norrell. John is the author of the groundbreaking new book, Show Up, Six Strategies to Lead a More Energetic and Impactful Career. He is the founder and chief executive disruptor of John Norrell Coaching, a career executive coaching, professional development consulting, and public speaking firm. Nestled in Washington, D.C., in the heart of the Dulles Technology Corridor, John Norrell Coaching has rapidly become a go-to solution for companies, systems, leaders, and employees to upgrade, reignite, and relaunch their core values and initiatives. A certified professional coach and master practitioner of energy leadership index assessments, John holds an MA in teaching from Monmouth University and a BA in psychology from Loyola University, Maryland. Equally, an in-demand keynote speaker, John's electric style and highly informative content have been waking up conferences, workforces, and association audiences nationwide. John and I really dig into some amazing topics on this episode, and you know we talk a lot about success, as we always do. I cannot wait for you to hear from John on how he defines success and what failures have shown up in his life in a way that have improved it and caused him to be able to succeed. I loved this conversation, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Before we do, just really quickly, if you or someone that you know feels unfulfilled, you're not sure what's missing in your life, but you just don't feel right, you feel like something needs to change and you can't identify what it is, you've spent so much time building the career that you're in right now that you just don't understand why it's not as fulfilling as you expected it to be, why your problems didn't disappear like they're supposed to. Maybe like me, you have an I'll be happy when moment and you're just waiting for that time to come so that all the pieces of your life can fall into place. If this sounds like you or someone that you know, I would love to help you find out what your perfect life looks like. I've created the Define Your Life Mastermind. It allows you to get clarity in areas, in all areas of your life, including your career, your relationship with money, your spirituality, your relationship with friends, families, romantic relationships, work relationships. What does self-care look like to you? What does entertainment look like to you? What is fun? look like? How do you feel when you have a whole well-rounded life? So many times we think that work is the problem or our relationship is the problem or we don't have enough money and that's the problem. When reality is there's something else missing and we're not fulfilled because we're not honoring something that's important to us. The Define Your Life Mastermind is designed to help you define what a perfect life looks like to you. And I emphasize that because it is different to you than it is to anybody else. Nobody else is going to have the same perfect life as you do. So you get to define exactly what that looks like. And then once you define what your perfect life looks like, we get to build a business around around that life so that you can have the life you've always wanted, the business that will support that life. And then we push you out of your comfort zone so that you can step out of that gray area where you just feel like you're staying safe and you can go out and live that life and build that business that you've just designed. If this sounds like something that you or someone that you know would benefit from, I would love for you to check out 
the Define Your Life Mastermind. We can jump on a call, see if we're a good fit to work together. Head over to defineyourlife.morethancorporate.com. There's a bunch of information there and an opportunity to book a call with me so that we can have um, a chat and I can answer any of your questions and we can decide if we're a good fit for each other. I'm super excited to connect with you. Until then, let's go ahead and jump into this conversation with John. John, thank you so much for coming on the show with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Amber. Same here. It's great to be here. I'm super excited. We're going to dig into so much stuff, but I know that your story really resonates with me from this idea of this corporate lifestyle and then realizing that there's so much more. Um, Before we get into that, let's go way back and look at what you thought your life was going to be like when you were like graduating from high school and preparing for your future. Oh, Oh, if things were just different, right? (laughs) (laughs) So I had these big aspirations for being a uh, a CPA. I, I, I loved working with math and with numbers and thought accounting was the way to go and macroeconomic principles did me in. And so that wasn't going to happen. And then I ended up figuring, well, I really like people. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and study to be a psychologist. And while I really, really like that, I also realized, and I always say this, is that I just wasn't emotionally mature enough to handle the whole psychology type lifestyle at 21, 22. Yes. Yep. So upon the advice of a really dear friend of mine, and he was also a faculty resident, um, he had suggested I go into teaching. And so that's where I spent 25 years of my career. I started out as a classroom teacher and then uh, progressed into some leadership roles within the educational system. Um, Back in 2010, I managed an instructional coaching program for DC public schools and supervised 21 instructional coaches across 13 middle schools. And to be a teacher and to have an opportunity to work in a larger district in a leadership role was great. And then I found myself at the state superintendent's office in DC. And if you treat DC like a state, even though it's not, they have a state education office and that's where I worked. And then I found myself at an educational nonprofit. And so here I was thinking I was going to be this corporate big wig and hotshot and I had this amazing career as an, as an educator and a leader and a school teacher and just loved every minute of it. That's amazing. So did you, how long were you in the education system total? Um, so six, well, actually, so it would, it would be 20 years total across all the places where I worked. And then the last five years was at an educational nonprofit where I did training and staffing direction for an 85 member team. Got it. So maybe more relevant than any other question that I might ask today is what advice do you have for all of our wonderful parents that are out there trying to be teachers now in the COVID-19 world? Oh, gosh. I, I've been following the news so closely, and I, I, I live outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia, and, and we're having... Um, I don't have kids of my own, but just following the news, um, our, our largest school district here, which is Fairfax County, is having huge issues with online learning. And so what I would say to all the parents that are out there that are, are trying to juggle homeschooling their kids and, and their work lives as well is to just remember that, that school is certainly a big structure for children, and, and it's both educationally as well as socially. There's so much engagement in things. And so as you're, as you're working with your kids, remember that it is so much more than just simply checking a box and being like, we got things done, but finding real opportunities to learn and to model and to showcase um, what real world applications look like. Um, and that can really go a long way. Like make the experience something that's going to be different and memorable rather than a hardship and a drudgery. Yeah, I love that advice for kids and parents. I also love it for adults because I feel like this check your box to get your next um, accomplishment and then move on is so much of where we spend our time. I know that's where I spent a lot of my time until the last four or five years. So this idea that it should be fun, it should be engaging, it should be educational. 
um, that's like life. Like we should all find ways to make our life that way. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. Absolutely. So you were in kind of this nonprofit situation with the schools. And then at some point in time, you decided to leave education behind. Why did you do that? What was the driving force? Yeah. So, um, it's, it's really nothing more than a values conflict. Um, and I say that because it, it related so much to how I was showing up at work. So the company where I was working for, we were, we were doing a lot of work with state departments of education. We were writing um, large-scale summative assessments. Think of those like end-of-year tests. And while I started out working and developing content, I had moved into this role where I was leading a team of 28, and then we had a reorg, and I ended up working directly under the vice president of this division. And so it was a lot of training and development but also it was a lot of organic coaching. So I found myself doing a lot of coaching with people um, across all of the teams within the division. And what I found was that people were just simply hungry for some support in addition to what they were getting in the organization. So it was everything from work-life balance to having conversations either with their direct reports or with their leadership or how they could be doing their job better. And even though I had this background in instructional coaching, I wanted to learn what quote unquote corporate coaching was like. And so in 2016, I enrolled in IPEC, which is the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. And it was a, a very rigorous coaching certification program. We had to do three, uh, three, three day in person weekends in addition to all of the, um, the, the online and hybrid learning that we were doing and the practice coaching and such. And, and I just got into it so much. And I, I saw myself bringing a coaching program to this organization, which is what I had wanted to do. And I went into my vice president one day and I, I shared with her this vision and I could tell that it wasn't landing as well as I had hoped. So I thought, okay, so let me, let me take a step back. Let me figure out if there's a different direction or way to go with this. And at the same time, I was building my practice on the side as well. So what I found was that I would go home at the end of the day super excited about working with my clients or working on content that I was putting out on social. And I was really dreading going into work every day because I just wasn't as fulfilled as I had hoped or had planned. And so in a really key moment, I walked into my vice president's office one day and I looked at her and I said, I need to ask you a question. And I'm going to ask you this question because I trust you. And I'm going to trust that you're going to give me an honest answer. Can I ask you? And she was sitting at her desk and I was sitting at her table and she's like, yeah, go ahead. I said, great. I'm trying to figure out my career path here. And the way I see it is it is at best horizontal. Now, while I'm at not risk of getting fired today um, or being let go, um, I really want to bring an internal coaching program here, and I, I just don't see that as being possible. So when I think about my future here, what I see is, is that I'm not getting a raise. I'm not getting promoted. I'm kind of stuck on this island to do what I'm doing, which is fine but I don't see really a lot of professional growth here for me in the way that I want it. How accurate am I? And Amber, she looked at me and she threw her arms up in the air and she goes, they just don't get you. <laughs> they just don't get what you do and the value you bring. And we got talking about how many times I had like coached people off the ledge from quitting and retaining them and, and, and just helping and support them in the day-to-day -day as a resource, as an extension of leadership. And at the end of it all, she looked at me and she goes, you're very smart. And I looked at her and I said, thank you. And I walked out of her office, did everything that I had needed to do. I was just finishing up plans to LLC my company and all those kind of things. And when all of that was done, 
it was about a few weeks later, I walked into her office and I said, it is with a tremendous amount of gratitude that I let you know that I'm going to resign because I have an opportunity to help more people on the outside than I do in. And, and wow. that, was what, that was what taking the leap looked like for me. That's so powerful because it all comes down to how many people can I help? And when, when an organization ties your hands because they don't see the value in the same way that you do, mm -hmm. it makes it very difficult to continue to move forward. And so many people get stuck in that spot because they're either afraid of the repercussions of having that conversation or they're afraid of voicing how they feel because then they might actually have to go out there and build this coaching practice. And so there's so much fear that we allow ourselves to get stuck in. How was that transition for you? Was there a, had you ever run your own company before or was this the first time? Yeah, I had, I had a consultancy um, in, in when I was teaching. So I was doing consulting work for um, some larger educational companies because um, as teachers, we look to supplement our income. So I had that and I had um, some tutoring jobs and things that I were do was doing as well. But there were, I just want to go back for one second though, because there was something about that whole situation, like when you were talking about the fear of things. So after getting that confirmation that, that my instinct and my perception or view on the situation was right, you know, I had a couple of options. I mean, one was that I could have been really, really angry with my executive leadership, or I could have been really grateful. And I'm not going to lie and say that there wasn't a part of me initially that was frustrated and angered. But what I came to learn was that all of this was, was a business decision. And that their vision and their leadership didn't align with mine. And so I, there's no like animosity or anything like that whatsoever, because in so many ways, it was a gift. I had five years in this organization and, and I was the one that changed. They didn't. I was the one that had changed. So because I had this past experience in growing a side business, there was definitely some familiarity in, in making this leap. I also hired a business coach. I hired a business coach to help me with a lot of the logistics and structure to get my practice off on the quote unquote right foot that I wanted to. So all of that being said, um, while there was some familiarity, there was still a lot of unknowns jumping into this business full time. And what was your um, what was your method or your practice for dealing with those unknowns and staying sane? Because I know that anybody you can help. It's totally different to have a side business and try to grow that and still have this very comfortable, safe, secure employment. Mm -hmm. But then you let that go and now this is your entire source of income and you're 100% responsible for your future and your success or your failure. Yeah. How did you deal with those unknowns to keep pushing yourself forward? So for me, it was about really making sure that I had a network and support of, of people around me that I trusted and I valued that I could lean on. So first and foremost, my husband, um, I mean, he, he does have a very stable job and that certainly made it easier for us as a couple, but there's still demands to be able to bring in money and things like that. But he has been on board from the start and simply say, look, if this is what you want to do. This is your turn to go ahead and do this and go. So obviously having that support at home was huge. Um, having my business coach as well, uh, because anytime things that came up that I wasn't sure of or I was frustrated by, I had him to lean into to help me with that. And then it was my coach community, the people with whom I became really good friends with and, and, and have, we, we often call ourselves our coach besties, um, to call up and just say, hey, I have a question about this, or I'm not sure how to navigate this situation, or, you know, can you, can you help me with this? I'm trying to bat this idea around. So I had all of these different avenues in terms of my network that I knew that if I didn't have the answer myself, I had somebody in my network that I could go to, and they would be there to support and help as well. Yeah. Network is so important. And I, um, 
you know, first discovered this idea of networking when I opened my law firm. Mm. And what I thought of was networking at that point in time was definitely not networking. And then, you know, I, I get into this entrepreneurial world and I see like the connections that you can make and the people that can change your perception of what the future can really be like for you and what's possible and all of that stuff. And you realize that like, building those real connections with people so that when something like this comes up, you have a source of inspiration and problem solving and tools to get through something is so important. If you start going out and looking for those things when you need them, you're going to be in big trouble. A absolutely. You know, when I, when I start working with my clients and I'll ask them, how rich is your network? And so some of them will go, well, I've got 2,000 followers on LinkedIn or whatever. Great. But how rich is that? Yeah. Like, how could you tap into that as a source and go, there's, there's 20 people in this list. I mean, 1%, right? There's the math teacher coming out of me, right? 1% that, that you know you could tap into and they would be there for you in a moment and to be yeah. able to help you. And when we are a valuable connection resource and we're there to network with people in a way of, hey, how can I help you? And the time comes when we need their help. That's when we get to really know how valuable our network is. And when our network fails us, meaning that we don't we come to find out that our network isn't as strong as what we thought it was or it wasn't as good as what we thought it was we then have to go back to a very different place and rebuild differently in order to have those supports that we need. Yeah, it's so, um, it's so important. And, you know, I will say on that point as well that sometimes we try so hard to nurture the wrong relationships. Like mm -hmm. um, we talk, I know that I've been guilty so many times of saying, I just don't know how to continue to nurture all these relationships because I only have so many, so much time and I can't reach out to them all. And the reality is if you have to try that hard to nurture that relationship, then it's not a relationship that you're meant to have right now in this point in your life. Like the ones that are on the same path as you will naturally be engaged and involved in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's also that other piece to it as well, where we can energetically present ourselves uh, or show up, if you will, in a way where, where we come across as being needy. And, and of course, right now we're in the middle of COVID. No one's going out and meeting people face to face, right? But, but have you ever been at a networking event where somebody comes up to you and within their first breath? Oh, no. They're, exactly. They're launching into, here's what I need, right? Yeah. I need a job. I need you to connect me with so-and-so or whatever. And you're sitting there and you're like, I don't even know if I like you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and so that kind of needing energy, and it's, it's often equated to dating too, right? That kind of needy <laughs> energy, it never goes well. And so it can be really difficult for people when they're, they're coming from a place of wanting to build their network, but needing to be really clear on how valuable they are to somebody else to grow that relationship. Yeah, 100%. And I, I agree with that completely. It's, it's our ego too that gets in, in the way because I know that there have been a lot of times that I have been in rooms with some people that... Um, you know, I, I'm a very confident person, but I also have this place of a complete lack of confidence that I think we all go to every now and then. And when you get in that place and you're in a room of what you perceive to be very successful individuals, what that shows up like is, let me show you how much I belong to be here. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, your lack of confidence starts regurgitating all of the reasons that you deserve to be in this conversation. And you're showing up in a way that is completely contrary to who you really are, number one, who these people want to connect with, number two, and number three, who you should be showing up as. 
and and without having to be physically in the room, without having that opportunity right now because of COVID, we, we've kind of gotten relegated to how we're showing up on the screen and, and how we're communicating via email and everything. And so whether whether you call it imposter syndrome or you call it the, the negative self-talk and coaching, we call it the gremlin, like whatever that is, um, that can manifest in a way where then you start looking at, at everybody that's out there and go, well, of course they're all experts and I'm the newbie and I'm coming yeah. into this room and I've got to prove my worth and myself and, and I need to come at it this way. And, and the playing field makes it so different because if, if we were to go to a networking event, right, or, or I've coached some of my clients on, you go to a networking event and you're there in person, and I always say to them, what's the ground rule you want to set? How many valuable connections do you want to make at this event? And I'm like, yeah. what would it look like if you made two? Yeah. Like you just made two really good connections that you could be like, I'm going to go out to coffee with this person. or I'm going to follow up with a phone call and do that. And you got these two really great connections and you got out of there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just, just to take some of that pressure off. Because when we go to networking, we just want to be light. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right? We, yeah, we need to think about it in terms of you'll like me when you know that I'm, I'm valuable and I'm trustworthy and, and I can support you and hopefully you can support me as well. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, we kind of naturally rolled into this conversation, but it seems like a perfect time to talk about this wonderful new book that you have yeah, out. Thanks. What's the name of it? So the book is called Show Up, Six Strategies to Lead a More Energetic and Impactful Career. And I'm in the middle of writing my first book. So I feel like I'm qualified to ask you this question. What in the hell were you thinking? What crazy, what crazy thoughts went through your mind when you thought writing a book was a good idea? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so in my, in my previous life as a math teacher, I had written, I think the total was seven. So I had written seven math books. Um, a lot of them were for Casio, which was like a, a package product with the materials and stuff that we were sending out. But, um, but I had also written a state test prep math book for Barron's. Um, and so I had some experience in terms of writing the book. But this book was so different than anything else I had ever written. So I knew logistically the, the structure that I needed to write everything. What I wasn't anticipating was at times how much of an energy drain the writing process would be because this book is so personal to me. And, and, and writing it for people who are simply looking for a different way to approach their career at whatever stage they are in um, to really help tap into who they are energetically to make the impact they want. So to your question, there were a lot of late nights. There were a <laughs> lot of times when um, I didn't go out with our friends um, because I, I was on a good roll with, with getting stuff written and I wasn't going to dinners and those kind of things. And it's the, it's the sacrifices we make in order to put the words on the paper to serve the people who are going to read them. Yes, um, I 100% agree. And, you know, there's a couple things I want to talk about in this. The first is, um, did you have a coach? Did you have a schedule? Did you, what was your actual process like in writing the book to keep yourself on track? Or did you just write when it felt good to you to write. I'm pretty sure it's not the last one because your book never would have gotten written, but um, <laughs> what was your process like? All right, so um, super, super easy tool. Um, I had the most obnoxious Excel spreadsheet no. known to an author, <laughs> right? So, so what worked for me was that I had set a goal to finish writing the manuscript, but then for the different sections and parts of the book, what I would do is I would create a column in this spreadsheet. Um, and what I would do is that as things and ideas came up, I would add them to the column. And then when I was ready to write that column, I would go through and make sure I hit all of those points. And then I would let it sit for a bit and as other things would come up, I'd add it to the column and go back and revise and edit. 
but I looked at the book as one complete manuscript in about nine or 10 different parts. And so I would, I would color code these sections on the spreadsheet to know, okay, I wrote that, I wrote that piece, I need to go back for that. And then the other thing I did was that I hired an editor and I hired an editor to do a first, a content review. So to read the book for clarity, consistency, fluidity, to make sure it was easy to read. And then I hired him to go back and do the grammatical edits on the book. And so I didn't hire a, a writing coach or anything in that regard because I, I knew I was structured enough to get the book written. But but engaging an editor in that process was extremely helpful. I bet. And did you use the same editor for your content editor and your grammar editor, or did you use I two did. different? And then did you did. have him edit sections or the entire manuscript? So did you send no, him he, those columns? He edited the entire manuscript. And so what was really helpful, and I think this is why, I'm just going to give a shout out to Rich Lucy here for a minute. Um, he goes by Captain Red Pen. Um, <laughs> and there's a reason why he goes by Captain Red Pen, which is great. Um, because he had done the content review, Amber, he, he knew the overall flow of the book. And so when he went back to edit it and take a look at it, he had already done like the shifting of different parts or paragraphs or things to make it flow a little bit better. So even going through that editing review and looking at it word by word, he, he also had the familiarity with the text that the, the messaging and the structure was there to then only have to focus on the editing piece. So the content part was done and then he could go back and just edit the book. That's um, amazingly useful. Um, the second thing that I want to focus on, um, because this is where I really got caught up and had to push myself through, is I um, am lucky enough to have basically grown up in the Facebook generation. Mm. So when I started looking at the things that I had gone through that I wanted to be able to talk about, I initially was like, okay, what's the best way for me to make a timeline out of things? The best way is for me to go through Facebook and like look at the things like the important dates. And that's what I planned on doing. What I didn't plan on doing was seeing that in 2016, when I was going through all of this stuff, I was posting the same inspirational stuff that I'm posting now. I just hadn't really learned what it meant yet. Like it was that planting seeds period. So the emotional side of going back in and remembering the things that you have to remember and the mindset that you were in and how you felt when you were struggling the same way that your audience is going to be struggling when they read your book is extremely energetically draining. And I know that you mentioned that, but I wanted to touch on that for a minute because mm -hmm. I think that there's no way to understate or to overstate how draining it can be to go back into that place. I, I completely agree, and I'm so glad that you shared that as well. And and it's one of those things where, you, because you said, you know, you are part of the Facebook generation, we can go back and look at things and see things that are posted. But our stories are so powerful because they are our own. Yep. And And it's one thing to tell it. It is another thing to write about it. And, and I, I can vividly remember when I got done with a certain part of that book that there was a box of tissues that, <laughs> that, got, that got used pretty quickly because it had just stirred up so much. But it, was, it wasn't a sad thing. It was, it was a lot of things. And, and part of it was just being grateful to be able to put all that out there. Um, so this might be an unfair question. And if it is, you can tell me and you can expand more than this, but if there's one or two things that you hope that people take from your book, the top one or two things, what would you say that is? Oh, no, I think that's a great question. Thank you for asking I just that. didn't know if you could narrow it down to one or two, because people are like, my whole book's amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I, I can absolutely do that. So there's a, there's a part in the book and it's one of the six strategies which is own where you are. 
And, and if anybody that reads my book could take that part away from it is that we, we get to stand in our truth, the truth about who we are. It is about our personal mission. It is our agency. It is why we do the things that we do, whether we're the CEO of some company or, and thank God for them, you know, the grocery store workers and the medical professionals right now who are doing their jobs so beautifully. And when we take this opportunity to own where we are, we are vulnerable. And, and to live in that vulnerability and to how we get to show up for ourselves, both personally and professionally, is really about giving ourselves the space and the grace to be who we are and to thrive. And that, that would be the one takeaway that I would, I, I would just be so grateful if, if people resonated with and, and they got that as one takeaway from the book. Wow, that's super powerful, super powerful. And what I love about that so much is, you know, we're in this personal development space where we're constantly trying to improve ourselves. And I always try to impress on people that there is a difference between trying to improve yourself and trying to change yourself. In order to really grasp these personal development concepts and use them to become the best version of yourself, you have to be comfortable with where you are, but then willing to say, I want to grow in these areas. If you're doing this work for the purposes of changing who you are, then um, you're going to have a completely unrealistic expected outcome. So I love this own where you are mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. So um, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about um, success and fulfillment and all of these wonderful topics that we don't think about enough. Um, so this podcast, as you know, was started on this idea that we don't take the time to define success for ourselves very often. We chase something that we don't understand. Um, and so for you personally, what does success mean to you? Hmm. Well, success has changed its definition over the years, without a doubt. Um, when, I was, when I was teaching, and we, I, would, I would end the class, and I would say to my students, go create a successful day. And usually what would happen is that a few months would go by and they heard this same thing over and over again. And they were like, what's a successful day? What, is that, what does that mean? And I was like, you know, success gets to be what you choose to define it as. So for me, I really try not to focus on the quote unquote bigger things, but it's the smaller things for me that I get to do as best as I can. Success for me is meeting with a client one-on-one -on -one, and they're better at the end of that hour because of our coaching session. It's, it's the relationship that I get to have with my husband that we get to move our relationship forward each and every day. Um, there, is, there is family of origin and there is family of choice. And so for me, success is ensuring that the family that I have is are, are people with whom I would go to bat for. And, and I, would, I would foster those relationships over and over and over again. And so, so success to me is just being able to, to move the needle a little bit forward each day that strongly align to the core values that, that I have or that anybody has for them, you know, but it's moving the, the needle in alignment with your core values. That's what gets to make a difference. That's where we get to measure our success and our impact. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. So my follow-up to that is I, I feel like so many times this idea of success and the idea of fulfillment are either treated like the same thing or interchangeable. And I think that they're entirely different. So for you, does success come first before fulfillment or does fulfillment come first followed by success or are they entirely unrelated? Oh, um, that's such a great question. And as you, were, as you were leading up with the different choices, the one thing I knew was that success isn't first, right? For me, fulfillment is always before success, Right. So 
if you if you let's say you play a sport, right? Um, did you play a sport growing up? I did. I played volleyball. Okay. Yeah. Great sport. Right. And, and I'm a bowler and I'm a professional bowler. And, and of course we're not bowling right now, but, but I'm very thankful that back in 2010, I won a title on the PBA regional tour and people would go, that's a success, right? Yeah. It's a success because I came in first in one tournament that that's an outcome, right? There's a, there's a, a definite data point. The fulfillment was all of the work that led up to it the practicing, the, the training, the coaching that I had gotten, all of that is, is what I believe is fulfilling. The fulfillment is what drives us. The success is just the outcome, right? So if you have a goal of making $100,000 this year or a quarter million dollars or a million, whatever that is, all that is is a data point, right? It's about the steps you need to take in order to make that happen. That gets to be the fulfilling part. That's where you get to learn and to grow and to develop that, that so oftentimes, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, and people will say, I'm ready for a promotion because I've put in the time. Yes. You're not entitled to anything. Thank right? you. Yeah. You're not entitled to anything. So why are you the right person for the job? What have you learned along the way that's going to make you more valuable in this position? And so, so the part about fulfillment is what intrinsically drives us. Yeah, I um, am so glad that you said that because I feel like especially in, I know that I was stuck in that spot. Like I didn't think that I was this entitled person that believed that I had earned something. But I will tell you that after I graduated from law school, I felt like I had earned a job as an attorney. Like I did everything that I was supposed to do. Now give it to me. And that <laughs> life doesn't work that way. No. So, <laughs> so when I had to take, you know, a, an entry level law clerk position, I was devastated and stuck in that spot that you were just talking about of mm -hmm. this isn't where I'm supposed to be. I deserve more, you know, and it prevented me for a long time from number one, showing up as my best person, mm -hmm. but number two, being able to provide the value to those around me, including my clients and my, and my firm, um, because I was stuck in that spot of I've earned this, I deserve this. Um, and so I think that that's a super powerful concept because at some point in time, we do think I put in the work, now give me the outcome. I, I remember being, it was the second school where I taught at. I, it was my third year teaching overall. I had a master's in teaching. And I was, and I was doing really good work. And I'm also going to say I probably got a little full of myself being like late 20s. And my department chair we call them coordinators, but you know, the guy that was overseeing and mentoring me and everything pulled me aside one day and he said, John, I'm going to tell you a couple things. He said, first of all, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. He said, secondly, God forbid you walk out of this school and you get hit by a bus. There's going to be a moment where we go, oh, he was a really nice guy and I need to get somebody else in to teach her classes. Ooh. Don't ever forget to be humble because we're all easily replaced. Wow, that's super, super powerful. Super and powerful. I, I remember, like, I remember standing there and looking at him and going, what the hell did you just say to me, right? And I'm still really good friends with him to this day, but it was that moment that I needed to shake me in my boots. It's that like own where you are moment, which is like, stop being so cocky and arrogant and remember that you're not entitled to anything. Just do a really good job and things will fall into place. Yeah, that's so important. It's so important for us all to learn. Um, so for you, as far as this journey, like you've had so many experiences between education and then moving into the nonprofit and then deciding to open your own coaching business and consulting business. So for you, what do you think as far as being willing to push yourself out of your comfort zone, being willing to face that fear, what has been the driving force for you to stop yourself from holding back in times that you know you need to push forward? Service. 
service to others. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely that, right? So when I, when I go back to that conversation I had with my VP, this was all about being able to serve as many people as I can. And so what drives me is who is out there that I can help. Yes, it's my business. And yes, there's a part about making money and all those kind of things. But there's that, that larger component, which is who is out there that I can help. And helping doesn't completely mean somebody hires me as their coach, right? It's about following me on social media and you're registering with a, a post that I've made and that changes your perspective on something that day or it gives you something to think about or maybe it, it pushes a button in a way that you're like, I can't believe I read this from him. And yet, I mean, those are the, the multiple ways that, that we in our roles, we get to serve. And that's what, it is what drives me. And at times it is what keeps me up at night as well. That's such a powerful answer. I have really enjoyed our conversation today. And I think there's so many valuable lessons in your story. If people want to connect with you to follow up on the podcast, or if they want to connect with you about your book or anything to that effect, where's the best place for people to reach you? Yeah, so the best place to reach me, you can find me on LinkedIn at John Nerrell. So it's J-O-H-N-N-E-R-A-L. You can check out my website at johnnerrell.com. You can email me at john at johnnerrell.com. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all those kind of places. But um, any of those is fine. I would just, if, if anybody who's listening, if they have any thoughts or comments, would love to hear from them. Um, but, but LinkedIn or email is primarily the best at this point. Love it. And before we wrap up, I would love to let everybody get to know you a little bit more with a quick random round. Are you okay with that? Oh, I'm go, go for it. This has been great. Thank you. Perfect. All right. What profession other than your own do you think would be fun to attempt? Meteorology. Really? Yes. I, I had always, growing up, I wanted to be the guy who stood in front of the green screen and gave you the weather and, uh, and be the guy that came into your living room at night and told you what the weather would be. So that's amazing. That be. <laughs> so if you could time travel, where would you go and why? Oh, I would want to go a hundred years from now and just see where we are. Interesting. Um, what personality trait or skill or quality do you think has been most helpful to you throughout your life? Perseverance. Okay. Um, there's, there's been a lot in my story where just being able to persevere through a whole bunch of stuff has been really helpful. That's awesome. As far as books are concerned, are you a reader or do you like to listen to audiobooks? I am more of a reader. Um, but a, but a good audio book is always, uh, is always good in the car, though I'm more inclined to listen to podcasts in the car than anything. Okay. And what book have you recommended to people the most? Oh, there is a great book called How to Say Anything to Anyone by Sherry Harley, S-H-A-R-I, and then Harley like the motorcycle. And so many things in her book have just had a profound effect on me and my work. And it was one of those books that I had read on a cross country flight and I got off that plane and I was like, this book is awesome. And I brought it into my organization uh, where I was working at the time and shared it with a bunch of people. And to this day, I still share it. Love it. Um, all right. As the music nerd, I always have to ask, what song pumps you up right now? What's kind of this, your motivational song or what's on repeat for you? Oh, wow. Um, well, in light of the concert on Saturday night, the song that's been playing through my head a lot is I'm Still Standing by Elton John. Oh, wow. So good. All right. And then lastly, um, and we may have already talked about this a little bit when we were talking about your book, but if you had one opportunity to tell people something that they could carry on with them, um, what would you want them to know? That how we show up matters and that we all have a choice in terms of how we get to show up energetically it is, it is a conversation that is more than just what you do. It is the conversation about who you are. 
and the relationships you build and how you bring them into your personal and professional life to make the impact you want. Oh my gosh, so powerful. Thank you so much for coming on and spending some time with us today. Again, for any of you listening, John Neural Coaching. Neural. Thank you. John Neural Coaching.com. Uh, no, not coaching. How no, about just, just John, John Neural.com? Thank you. Uh, yeah. My apologies for that. So um, go ahead and check that out as with the book um, and you can connect with John that way. John, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Amber, thank you so much for the time. I, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know your podcast and appreciate what you're doing. And, and thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the show. I hope that something that was said resonated with you or provided value to you in one way or another. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on the show. You can reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram at Amber Furman. Also, I've created a Facebook community for followers of the show to interact with me and other members of the community. You can find that on Facebook at More Than Corporate. So go ahead and join that group if you'd like to stay up to date on podcast happenings and meet some really cool people. Again, thanks so much for tuning in.